Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much, Serkan, for inviting me to present or to give an overview of ITC's research. Uh, and thanks also to uh, uh, Ijen, Bob, and uh, Tom for organizing this. And thanks to all the participants having interest in this topic uh, and all the presenters making this a very interesting day. I was asked by Serkan to give an overview of what we do at ITC. And uh, what I will do is, within 10 minutes, it's not comprehensive. But what I try to do is to show a, a couple of examples of which also link a little bit to what the topic is of today, which is open geodata. Let me start by reiterating of what ITC's mission and vision is. And uh, as Frank already indicated in the beginning, at ITC, the main mission is capacity development, and in, we apply and we facilitate and we share geo information and Earth observation for tackling global wicked problem. And our focus is in particular to identify vulnerabilities and then think of geospatial solutions to convert these vulnerabilities into resilience. So a, a main focus is on, sustainable uh, on the sustainable environment and on an inclusive society. So on the one hand, the geo information and the earth observation, and on the other hand, focusing on sustainability and inclusive uh, society. With regard to the vision, we focus a lot that different people, different researchers, educators, students can collaborate across different boundaries, disciplinary boundaries, department boundaries, but also across geographic divides. And we aim to work with different stakeholders, governmental institution, non-governmental institution, businesses, etc., to really to design together different solutions to today's complex challenges in order to contribute to a sustainable, fair, digital society. So this is a nutshell what we aim for, and our research activities focus very much on real-world problems and using geospatial data methods and tools to generate new knowledge on these problems and uh, think of how we can design solutions. In this slide, I try to give an overview of the different kinds of challenges that we focus on. Needless to say, a very urgent issue is climate change. Climate change is obviously connected to many other things. Think of disaster risks, think of droughts, think of food systems, food security, because of drought or because of other issues. There's also an increase in the world population, and with the increase in world population, it's no uh, secret that there are more people living in cities. So we are changing a lot of the land use, the land cover into concrete, which also has effect on, for example, other phenomena like urban heat, air pollution, which is a serious health issue. But next to these more societal problems, there are also geocomputational issues. So there are challenges of how can we can overcome them, but there may also be ethical considerations by these new kinds of development. And this set of global challenges are challenges that we also want to pay attention. So we think we have the ambition to create new knowledge and responsible solutions using geospatial data methods and tools to address these complex challenges, but more importantly, to also create a local impact. We also want to align with societal and technological development. And as an example, I chose a project where also a couple of people here in the room participated, which was on the resilience of transport systems, because these are very important in food systems for food security. Food is not only produced and consumed, but food is also transported. And understanding then the transport system, uh, water, for example, resilient routes to transport food from A to B, is a very important component. And uh, what is the beauty of this project is that people from different disciplines, people from different departments, also making use of the geocomputing platform, collaborated in thinking of how can we quantify or how can we analyze uh, the, food, the transport system in relation to food systems. Within ITC, we are organized in different scientific departments. Each scientific department has a research theme, 
And uh, I thought it's useful to show them that you also know a little bit about the different kinds of topics uh, that are addressed within this building and in the future building on the campus. One is for the Earth, which focuses a lot on Earth system analysis. Think of uh, analyzing um, different um, environmental processes, but also looking at, uh, at the underground geological issues, mineral explorations, etc. Then we have water cycle and climate. Organizers are, today they are from that research theme, EGN and Bob. Forest, agriculture, and environment in the spatial sciences. They focus a lot on uh, biodiversity, agriculture systems, but also ecosystem services. We have acquisition and quality of geospatial information. Uh, in short, also, uh, there are also some presentations today, so we will get more insights on that. Spatial temporal analytics maps and processing. Everything around geodata and tools and how to effectively use them to understand um, spatial temporal processes. And we have people, land and urban systems, also the department where I come from myself, focusing on spatial planning, uh, land administration, urban issues. And Monica, who is also in the audience, will give a presentation on one of the topics within that department. So on the one hand, we have six scientific departments, and because there's a lot of diversity of re there are, look, there's a lot of diversity on research topics within all these different departments, we thought it's useful to identify four focus areas where we want to bundle the different expertise, the different disciplines, in order to address complex problems in a more effective manner. We have identified a geo AI. And with GAI, you can think of everything related to uh, artificial intelligence, in particular for geodata, also looking at big data, but also looking at respons responsible GAI, looking at the ethical considerations that come with big data and artificial intelligence. Another topic is geohealth. In geohealth, we mainly want to look at the drivers of spatial patterns of health and disease in a dynamic way and also think about what are different response strategies. For example, what could be planning intervention to address different spatial patterns that we are observing. A third theme uh, is resource security. And uh, there are several, depart uh, several departments that focus on resources. Think of land, think of minerals, think of energy resources connected to minerals, think of food and biodiversity, but also think of water. And within the topic of resource security, we want to look at the sustainable use of the natural environment, try to use as little resources as possible, but also think of how we can address one or the other component related to resource security. So how can we do more with less resources? And the last topic is disaster resilience. This topic is also connected to the center of uh, disaster risk, disaster resilience. And um, in the disaster resilience, we focus on natural hazards in particular, different kinds of risks generated by hazards. And we, the focus is on assessing risks, but also thinking of strategies, how we could reduce risks, how we could pre prevent risks, but also how we could recover after a heavy disaster has happened. So on the one hand, we have these four pro profiling themes, and then there are also a couple of cross-cutting elements. A cross-cutting element, uh, it's, a, it's a given, is geospatial data methods and tools. Another cross-cutting, which touches upon each profiling theme, is climate change. Climate change influences disasters. Climate change influences resources. Climate change also has an impact on health. So there are different components that are cross-cutting. Spatial planning and governance is also an important element in all the four themes. We have a vision on open science, and I will come back to this a little later. We also, in the development of a geo-citizen science hub, we want to address real-world problems, so we focus on challenge-based research, and an important component is to do research in a responsible and in a fair manner. Fortunately, we also have a quite 
good research infrastructure. One of GRIP is also one of the components, but we also have a geoscience lab, we have a remote sensing lab, we have a drone center, we have a, a, a laboratory for to support interactive uh, collaborations. This is the design and, um, and interactive space for co-creation. We have um, VISUS, which focuses in particular on visualization, uh, interactive visualizations. We have living labs, but we also have a digital twin geo hub. As you can see also from the list, we are still not sure whether we should use the term center or hub or lab, but all these different components are important components to support our research activities. For example, uh, a very recent addition is the digital twin geo hub. Uh, in this digital twin geo hub, researchers from different departments, uh, for example, PGM, GAP, but also EOS, work together to develop replicas, digital replicas of the physical environment, of the physical living environment. And it's connected also to the topic of today because in order to, to represent these digital replicas, you need many data, spatial temporal data. Another example is the living lab, we call it short LILA. And LILA is a space of experimentation at the campus. And also in that space, we think that we will also generate lots of data because we want to measure many things in the underground, above underground, of vegetation. And this space of experimentation will help us to better understand how, to, how certain processes function and uh, how we can do certain things. And it's also an important facility for education, but also, for example, for businesses who want to experiment one or the other component. I want to show a few examples. Uh, I really cherry-picked, so it's not a comprehensive overview in relation to the four profiling themes. Uh, I chose projects which are funded by different funding agencies to also give you an, an idea of what our typical projects are. And uh, I would like to start with the first project which in disaster resilience, which is Paratus. And the main aim of uh, Paratus is really to promote disaster preparedness. And in this project, the researchers focus very much on compounding risk. So not just one type of risk, but that one risk triggers the next risk. And what the researchers in this project try to do is to develop a platform where they can do an open source, open access platform, where they can actually do an assessment of the different uh, risks, where they can also develop certain measures uh, in to, in to reduce the risk, and then develop different scenarios to respond to this risk. And a typical feature of this project is that different stakeholders are involved because the tools are for stakeholders, but in order that stakeholders also use the tools, they are also involved in the development of the tools. So this is one of the projects within disaster resilience to offer open, uh, an open source platform for dynamic risk assessment. The second topic is resource security, as I mentioned before, and uh, I chose one project which is funded by ASA because in this project, the, what the researchers do uh, um, is to use different types of Earth observation data of different, of different sensors to measure two vegetation parameters. On the one hand, the leaf area index, on the other hand, also the fraction of absorbed photosynthetic active radiation to better understand the climate system. Because the climate, it's a dynamic system, and by measuring the leaf area index and the, the, and the active radiation, they can better understand how climate behaves. And by linking it also to other climate variables, we can get a better understanding of and monitor also the climate system. Interesting of this project is that there's also a big focus on a, a strong focus on a validation, but also to, to connect it to other essential climate variables. And it's a project with different partners across Europe to really provide new insights and time series, making effective use of available images. A third project is in the domain of GeoAI. Uh, the project is called Do Not Harm, and uh, the, 
basic principle of this project is that very often we started um, geospatial intelligence, for example, combined uh, from Earth observation data and drone images, can help us to address humanitarian problems. But in this project, it is turned around to understand to what extent is geospatial intelligence actually, um, how it's actually focusing our, or uh, in, in contrast with these uh, core principles of do not harm. So what kind of biases do we include in different kinds of algorithms to combine, for example, Earth observation and drone images, and what kind of impact would they have on those core principles? And what you can see here on the right hand, it's, a, it's an image looking at land parcels, because very often drone, uh, drones are also used to identify land boundaries, administrative land boundaries. And in that way, they want to show these differences of how boundaries are actually drawn, depending on how the training is done for the algorithm. If the algorithm is only trained in the formal area, you might get a biased outcome for the informal areas. And as a last topic, uh, geohealth, as already said, in geohealth we look a lot on the spatial patterns of drivers that affect health and, uh, and different patterns of diseases. This is a project uh, um, that focuses on pollen, especially with the changes in the climate, there's also a change in exposure to pollens and uh, in that project, machine learning is used to really model the spatial and the temporal patterns and also combined with weather predictions. And the idea is to develop a compass that can help people to think about which trees are safer or less safe uh, for if people have an allergy towards pollen. It's, but there are also many other examples in the health topic. Uh, think of exposure to air pollution, think of exposure to uh, urban heat, but also think of access to uh, health facilities. Right, and I would like to close with our way of working. As already said, open science is a very important principle for our research activities, and not just open science in terms of access to our publications, but also access to open data in the afternoon. Masuma will give a presentation on uh, open <coughs> flagship data sets because we work with Earth observation data and these are also unique possibilities to effectively contribute open data on one or the other phenomenon. I also say open tools, and with open tools I mean different kinds of algorithms, for example, uploaded to GitHub, but also tools like interactive maps that we are producing or, or apps that we are using. And citizen science is also one component that we want to in, um, develop increasingly or incorporate increasingly in the different projects that we are carrying out. Another component, and I think that's also very nice to see today, is the collaboration among researchers within and across departments. So also the participation today is also a reflection on that. A third component, in our research we use a lot participatory methods and tools to involve stakeholders, in particular when there are also questions on generating impact, so how can we actually implement a certain tool, or how can we implement a certain recommendation. And uh, fourth, also the responsible use of geodata methods and tools, linking to one of the previous projects, Do Not Harm, so to minimize uh, the risk for certain uh, stakeholders, for certain members of the society, but also reduce the risk for the environment. And a, a more recent topic is also science communication. So how can we communicate about our research that it is also picked up um, for those for whom we actually want to do the research. And with this, I would like to close the presentation and uh, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much for this nice presentation, Karin. So if we have a few minutes for the questions. Uh, from the audience? Anyone? Yeah. Hi, my name is Fong from Open Geo Hub. 
I have a question about the project you mentioned, do not harm. Do not harm. So I wanted to know, based on the algorithm and the geodata, what is the actual impact of a practical um, human humanitarian action? What is the, the case to use this data to improve? Uh, what kind of uh, human humanitarian action can you uh, give some examples for me? I will, that would be great. I could Thanks. imagine, for example, um, if you delineate boundaries of land parcels, and uh, so that that's done by the algorithm with a certain bias maybe in it, that these boundaries are not correct. If there is, for example, a disaster, uh, for example, um, uh, destroying one or the other component that would help to recognize one or the other boundary, then afterwards, if these boundaries are drawn wrongly, uh, you don't know anymore who is the owner of what. Or there may be conflicts on different boundaries. So because we make very precise delineations with, uh, with our methods and tools, which are also incorporate a certain subjectivity, and that may generate conflicts, for example, where you <coughs> draw the certain boundaries, or who would be the owner of a certain parcel. Equally, yeah, a similar example would also be in forestry. So there are really disputes about, you know, like who possesses what part of the area, what can you access or not. 